Welcome to the Epic Melon Podcast, conversations with the real humans behind broadband networks, cybersecurity, and the future of communications, brought to you by QA Cafe. In this episode, I chat with Sophie Poole at DT to talk about the consumer networking experience, being able to relate to it as a user, and why Wi-Fi product testing isn't really as boring as it sounds. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of the Epic Melon Podcast. I think this is episode 14. <laughs> Which is funny because I've already lost track and it's only like, you know, in the teens. <laughs> Too many good guests, I'm sure. Uh, with... Oh, yeah. Oh, right, right. It's all a blur now. No. Um, <laughs> with me today is Sophie Poole uh, from DT, um, and she's the QA lead for RDK devices. And I will explain what all of that means once we get started. <laughs> but I really appreciate you being on, Sophie. I think uh, I think this is going to be fun. I think, um, you know, it, it's always a good story to tell. Um, as yeah, usual, uh, the Epic Melon Podcast is, is, is brought to you by QA Cafe. And as such, uh, the opinions expressed by myself or Sophie do not reflect those of QA Cafe or its ownership. And I imagine that is especially the case for you and DT. Yes, I do. Because <laughs> I'll have to say, like, having somebody who's working for an operator on is like, it's like so great because usually <laughs> we have to tiptoe around a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I, I, I love, it's like, I love, I love you guys to death, like all you operators out there, but man, <laughs> sometimes... <laughs> Fire yeah. all your lawyers. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I, so because we're entirely funded by QA Cafe, I like to give a little uh, introduction about the three products that we offer at QA Cafe. The first is CD Router, which is the industry standard test solution for broadband gateways, Wi Fi routers, and customer premises equipment. It's also something that Sophie uses very often. <laughs> very often. Uh, CD Router <laughs> contains Thousands of fully automated test cases designed by network experts covering feature validation, stability, certification, and performance all in one. Moreover, QI Cafe's world-class support team acts as an extension of your own, helping you understand the technologies and build better products overall. Secondly, CloudShark is the way to make network packet captures an easy and useful part of your cybersecurity workflow. CloudShark helps you work on tough issues together without passing around large trace files, losing data, or risking security leaks of valuable information, and helps entry-level analysts learn from your senior experts, curate best practices, and standardize operating procedures around packet captures, which many people don't do. And lastly, QA Cafe's Passport is a fully automated solution for testing the connectivity and interoperability of IoT and smart home devices. Testing uh, with Passport is as simple as connecting your device, selecting tests, and getting clear pass-fail results with full log data and packet captures to find and resolve bugs before they end up as a bad review of your product. To find out more about CD Router, CloudShark, and Passport, find us at www.qacafe.com. Okay, that's out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Sylvia, I, I, I kind of explained a little bit of the format of the show before we started. Um, and uh, so I, I'm always interested in hearing the stories about how we got into networking because it's not usually the case that we did it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't you sort of get, you sort of get roped in. You know what? I would really love to work in networking. So yeah, it's uh, I'm sure it's a different story for everyone. <laughs> right, right, but, right. Um, like you say, not everyone wakes up when and dreams to be uh, in that industry for sure. <laughs> Well, once you do, once you do, it's it's yeah, it's exactly. Nice. It's, it's exactly. a nice industry to be in, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so how how did you how'd you get here? How'd you get here? So, um, so I went to the University of Bath uh, in the UK, and um, one thing that they are very good at that university is they offer um a placement year, um, which some a lot of universities across the UK do do, but um, Bath is one that is quite uh, you know keen on on a lot of their students doing that um so that's what i did and when i was looking for um different kind of placement options to that i could do um you know there's i was doing uh, mechanical and electrical engineering so there was quite a lot of options um right right you can probably understand but um you know and i i did you know what i didn't really know exactly where i wanted to go but one thing i did know is i was quite attracted to a, a strong brand and um, one of the brands that 
I did apply to and managed to, to get the internship for was um, Virgin Media. Um, so that's where I started, oh, cool. really. Um, so I did my first ever proper job um, at Virgin Media, um, where I was... So you uh, dove right in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> really did, really did. Um, so my internship, I was um, within the Wi-Fi testing space, actually. Um, but actually, looking back on it, it was kind of like, I, I don't want to say it was the perfect place, but what better place to kind of... Um, you know, a space to be in than something that you use every day, you know, like I'm of the generation, maybe giving away my age here, but I like from a teenager, I was in this generation where we were growing up with smartphones, like the kind of first teenagers or tweens or whatever you want to call them, where we're really like living on Facebook, living on Instagram. Um, Yeah, right. So (laughs) like, what more of a better fit, um, really, than to be I was I was not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm in that weird, I'm in the weird middle generation where like all of my cooler cousins were Gen Xers, but everybody younger than me is in a totally different generation. It's like, it's like from 1978 to 1982, right? They call it the yeah. Oregon Trail generation. <laughs> so I grew up well, I without the now. concept of an internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then right, and then right when we got into high school, that's when it was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um... So yeah, that's how I got into it. Kind of, sort of by accident, but sort of on purpose, um, if, if, if that kind of makes sense. So uh, yeah, like you say, mm-hmm, dive mm-hmm. straight in. I actually haven't worked in any other industry apart from, you know, like Saturday jobs when you're growing up as a teenager, but I didn't really tend to count those. Um, so yeah, dive, dive straight in. So for Wi-Fi testing that you started right away. So yeah. you said you were you were ME, you were ME and EE. Yes. Yes. So you were doing a lot of, were you... In school, were you doing a lot of the the, the Wi-Fi? Like, were you learning about Wi-Fi technology, multidimensional calculus, and all that? Not on a kind of application level, like on the kind of basic kind of signal analysis, that kind of thing. Yes, um, we did a bit of that at uni, but not not at school actually. I don't know if it's in the sort of curriculums now. I do wonder actually. I guess it probably right. should be at this at this point in time. But right. um, when I was then, <laughs> not. not um, at, at the kind of like first principles levels, yes, kind of, um, but not at the more application level, really. Um, so it was something kind of new. Um, right. And, you know, it was, it was actually super interesting when I was there, for sure. Right. And, it, and, and, and super important, too, because as soon as it's like I, I try to convey to, you know, in my effort to humanize, all, <laughs> you know, our, our industries. Right. It's like trying to convey to people that, like, you know, the stuff you learn in school is great. <laughs> Yeah, but it pales in comparison to the stuff that you end up learning once you start getting into yeah, exactly. the real field, right? Exactly. And especially, especially Wi-Fi, like especially. <laughs> it is interesting, right. actually, you know how how you know people. You know, there, there's that always common line, like when you're in maths class, when you're fourteen, fifteen. How am I ever going to use trigonometry in my real life? <laughs> and like, okay, not maybe specifically trigonometry, but it. People do use this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't right, like, right. I wasn't a super like maths keen kind of person in, um, in school, but you know, it does, it does get used in, in real life, which is, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that it's trying to turn what you learn in school into something real. I think that's the challenging bit for kids to understand. Right, um, right, right, right. You're never going to use trigonometry to do your taxes, but like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you are, well, maybe you're, you know, <laughs> you're a better person than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like if you're going to get into certain fields, yeah. then yes, you definitely need it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, so the, the fact that you immediately got into testing, so you, you were doing testing as part of the internship, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um uh, at the time, the team was taking like um, it, it had been. I'm trying to remember now. The the team had been formed for a good few years before I joined, maybe four or five years before I joined. So in some ways, um, was quite well established. But it was at the time where it was that real turn between what um, ISPs are offering and how they're offering it in terms of quality. It was like that. It like that 2014, 2015 time where the quality message really started like to take off um and then so... performance was like <laughs> quite, a, yeah. quite a big part of that 
Well, so it, and not to take a segue into something that we're probably going to talk to about at length later on, mm-hmm. but like that, the fact that it was happening back then is great, but it's even like, yeah. even now, mm-hmm. right. And e- mm-hmm. even with, even with the way that Wi-Fi itself is advertised yes. by the people making Wi-Fi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still about speed. Yeah. It's still about yeah. speed. Right. And, and, the, and the operators are still advertising based on speed. And yeah. it's like, it's, it's good to know that at least it was in their mindset 10 years ago. And now we're yeah. finally getting to the point where, where quality Maybe and reliability are the things that actually matter. Exactly. I mean, right. like, you know, uh, I, I do, again, we're, we're probably segueing quite quickly, but you know, in terms yeah, of yeah. when we're talking about <laughs> Put a pin in it. <laughs> these kind of things, you know, <laughs> like I do wonder, like when I speak to my friends, They've got no idea what the numbers mean. Literally no idea at all. They don't care. <laughs> They'll probably just pick the right. middle one. Um, it's like when you go to Starbucks. Well, no, and it stinks uh, because it's, 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 it's like as a marketing guy, right, I understand the value of that number because it's so easy to say that one thing is bigger than another thing. Yeah. So easy. Exactly. It's but hard to say that you're going to get the best gaming experience. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, so yeah, anyway, but, um, I, I brought up yeah. you getting into testing. Yes. I brought up you getting into testing right away because that's sort of what, that's sort of what I did. And that's sort of what oh, almost everybody here at QA Cafe did. Cause at the yeah. university of New Hampshire, where a lot of us went, um, there's Ooh, this, okay. uh, organization called the, the interoperability laboratory. Right. Ooh. And so we all dove into testing and it's kind of like, if you were to describe it to somebody to the outside world, it sounds kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that is like the most common question I get from my friends and family. Like, what do you actually do? <laughs> right. You know, and 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 Wi-Fi in particular because it's, you know, it's very hard to, uh, it's it's hard to be yeah. to isolate but, anything. <laughs> yeah, but at least Wi-Fi is a bit more tangible. People know what Wi-Fi is. People don't necessarily know like all of the back end stuff um that you know we're all oh, right 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 um so at least uh, in in some ways that was quite a nice introduction to testing because it's relatable whereas like right right um, even like voice stuff for me like i i barely used a uh, home phone ever really <laughs> like I, it's not been in my i don't um, think i have since yeah. 2004 yeah. 2004 I've, yeah. I've never had a home phone since exactly yeah. <laughs> like i've literally never so um that sort of stuff is makes it is a bit more it's less less relatable for me so i'm glad in a way that i started with wi-fi because at least i could correlate okay in my personal life i can understand what this means uh, and what it means i can and can't do um in a in a home environment i guess so um right, yeah right. it's a nice place to start right oh and and, and it's like I feel this very often that home networking itself is kind of a niche too, right? So like, mm-hmm. like when you think that the big dollars around network networking products out there are like, yeah. you know, Cisco, Ericsson, Juniper, mm-hmm. like, you know, the giant like pipelines of the world and data centers and enterprise networking and all that stuff. And we're kind of just like, hey, look at my cool stuff. Like, <laughs> Yeah, you're right. There are some big. This box big sits in your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is, it is, it's uh, it's interesting that there's this like whole hidden world, I guess, that the average consumer would have no idea about. Um, which right. you know, it's kind of it's weird in a way, but I guess most industries probably have some the same uh, kind of thing, right? There's this whole no, world no. It's true. Of- it's it's definitely true, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like I just even trying to explain to my family, right? Like, you know, if if something's wrong, <laughs> if something is slow, I have to be like, look, there's like a thousand <laughs> reasons why this could be not working right exactly. now. So don't exactly. look at me. <laughs> and if you want to have a go, turn it off and on again and see what happens. <laughs> 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 which which really frustrates me uh bob carrick from calyx he put it really great he's like um reboot is an unknown solution to an unknown problem <laughs> yes exactly exactly it's quite nice right? one. and you that. shouldn't be relying on that right <laughs> no no but it's the thing is everyone but it works sport of cool you know um and there must yeah. be a reason for that who knows what that is yeah. <laughs> well it was at uh Matt Matt Langlois was telling me about um, there was a there was a 
a device that we were testing a while back that basically was like designed programmatically to reset at like 3 a.m. every day or like Ooh. when it thought that the usage was low so okay. that it would not so it wouldn't ever get in a bad state <laughs> it's not counting for those 3 a.m. gamers then <laughs> yeah no i'm not one of them <laughs> just to say <laughs> so so what what sort of what what are you so uh, let's let's talk about rdk so that mm. we can explain to people what exactly that is and mm. how it relates to getting Wi-Fi. We're going to eventually get to the point, ladies and gentlemen, that, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, wi a Wi-Fi quality of experience over mm. just, you know, the things that it's designed to do. Mm. And one of those things is making sure that um, it's interoperable um, and that uh, it's very easily for easy for operators to, to deploy and cheaper than it was in the past. Um, because one of the things that has come up before that we were talking is how Wi-Fi, the reason why Wi-Fi is the way it is, and this is culturally too, from like the standards perspective, is that it's a consumer product, or it was a consumer product first. There's not a lot of other networking technologies that are like that, right? Mm -hmm. So Wi-Fi exactly. was consumer first. So everyone experienced it from, from selling a, selling a consumer electronics, not mm -hmm. from what we're trying to do with it now, where yeah. it is the logical end of the operator's network, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally different. And that paints the way the Wi-Fi Alliance does things. It paints the way that we that that everybody knows what about Wi-Fi, right? The, the fact that people treat Wi-Fi as the internet is synonymous, right? Yeah, so exactly. It, it <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so it, where was I going with that? Oh, uh, it's it, it it's interesting to me that uh, that that what we're trying to do right and and what what projects like RDK are trying to do is get it to the point where it is more interoperable. It's easier for operators to deploy because it matters to them because they're the ones who get the complaints in the end, right? <laughs> they're the <laughs> ones who service suffer when the Wi-Fi sucks. Um, but let's let's talk about what RDK is, uh, how it started, and how it relates to sort of the way that we're doing. CPE now than we've done in the past because I think that that's also a huge difference, right? Mm, for sure. So, from our perspective, um, or my perspective, you know, the what RDK brings to the table is the fact that we can it allows us to be a lot more flexible. Is the, probably the main point from from our side that I see the benefit and. Um, from an operator perspective, obviously that's great because it allows you to bring in more features as and when you see fit, rather than relying on, um, you know, an OEM and a, a fixed SLA and a fixed um, package that you have to. Teen work month on. process. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, um, and it allows us to, uh, from a quality perspective, and this is, I guess, where I come in. Um, it allows us to shift the testing left so that we can start to understand the behavior a lot earlier in the cycle um and right, that means right, right. quicker and therefore we can hopefully deploy it quicker as well um which obviously is the the main selling point in terms of um the operator perspective um right right for us as well i think it it, it allows us to focus on the more um, innovation topics that we otherwise weren't exposed to. And it, it does make it a bit more interesting for the, well, for, in an operator landscape for the developers and the and the testers um, uh, alike, you know, to be able to be exposed to all of those um, areas. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's so many benefits for sure, but from, from my perspective, that's probably the, the key one that I see, you know, um, brings the most to the table. Right, right, right. So for, for the, for the layman who are, are listening, like my dad, mm -hmm. who listens to this every, every day, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what <laughs> RDK is, it's called, it's, it's, a, <laughs> uh, it's the, it's, it's the reference design kit, um, mm -hmm. is, is the acronym, mm -hmm. but it's basically an, a, a, community designed open source operating system for 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 routers for wi-fi routers right mm -hmm. as, as consumers you're going to experience them as wi-fi routers it's not always a wi-fi router sometimes it's not something with wi-fi on it but mm -hmm. it's the, the principle we, what you know of it is is a wi-fi <laughs> and so because it's it's both open sourced and sort of designed by the community it is 
it, it's 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 washing out a lot of the uh, variation, the, the, the variations that would cause interoperability problems and integration problems and design problems for for those things. Now, the, the, what what is what is what is strange about this conversation is that projects like RDK and and projects like Purple, like are still are relatively new in in the grand scheme of things and so we went for a long time without those things yes <laughs> <laughs> and the world kept turning right. without them <laughs> yeah oh and so but it's a, a talk a little bit about that and 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 how it was sort of in the past versus now because mm. it's like you were saying like the the way that we design these products in the past uh you know, through OEMs and stuff was very different from the operator's perspective, right? And they had a lot yeah. more work to do. Well, not a lot more work to do. Now they have a lot more work different to do, but they're doing that work instead of having other people do it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think um, yeah. the from an operator's perspective, I guess what was happening previously is that we would have a whole list of things that we wanted um, a router to do. We would then hand that over to someone, in this case, an OEM, and they would basically do that however they wanted to. We would have maybe a little bit of say about how practically, you were, if we put it into a house perspective, we say we want the house to have um, three windows on the front, a front door, a back door, you know, but apart from that, you know, you guys do what you want. For all we know, they could have made it out of like sponge cake, <laughs> like, and it's not really a very good house. I'm not, I'm not saying the OEMs did do this, but you know, for all we know, they could have. You come um, home and it's like a hobbit hole. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily know. Okay, what what have they done here to make sure that this house is going to last through, through the next fifty, hundred, two hundred years? You know, um, we wouldn't right, necessarily right. know all of these things. We could ask for, um, you know, uh, reports and things, but we wouldn't have a, a very clear picture. Whereas if we're we've changed that now so that the actual build of that software um, um, comes internally, like you said, off a common sort of um, set of uh, rules, I guess you could, you could call it. Um, uh, we know that, okay, when you're going to build this house and you're going to build another house that's next door to it, they're going to kind of look similar ish and they're going to, they're going to look nice on the street together because they've come from the same um, foundations. Um, right. So I think in to put it into, like you said, into layman's terms, I think that's the benefit because um, A, we know exactly what's inside that house and B, um, it, it can work nicely with all the other houses on the street as well. Right, 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 right. Imagine, and in, in, in some cases, the analogy goes all the way down to like the electrical systems, yeah, right? Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> could have been radically different, and they do whatever they want, right? Yeah, exactly. What well, you want to know, you know when you plug in your TV, then it's going to turn on at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> right. The customer doesn't necessarily care what's what's behind it, right? Because we're going to go all the way back to people building their own operating systems, right? Yeah. Like you know, yeah. even, even before everyone started using you know Linux for for yeah. for gateways, everybody was really really doing their own thing, and then yeah. anything's on the table. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's definitely you know for us it, it's it's made things a lot simpler in a way there is this case of okay yeah the work has shifted um more towards our space and we're trying to work out how we best make that more efficient but on the mo for the mm -hmm. most part you know it's it's brought us more more benefit for sure yeah what, what 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 kind of benefits do you think other than sort of the speed of delivery i think um in terms of the actual features that we can deliver so it allows us to be we, we d wouldn't necessarily only have three options that we can choose for anymore. If we wanted to, um, you know, uh, give some more benefits and pass on more benefits to our customer, we have like a whole ocean now of options that we can go down to bring more benefits to our customers rather than say a set of three that we have to choose off the shelf. Okay. Yeah. We'll choose this one because right. it's the, <laughs> the worst sort of thing. So it, it allows us to be a lot more um, innovative with our products, I think. Cool, cool. Yeah, and and like, it's uh, it's like you said, the 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 difference in 
the the attitude has kind of changed a little bit. And I was gonna, uh, what was I gonna say about um, the the culture of it? Um, you know, now now sort of everybody sees that that's sort of where the writing on the wall is going. <laughs> you know, and and it would I, we've always dealt with this in um, in standards, right? Or just in any any particular tall, but especially in standards, like uh, there's sort of a ripping the bandaid off of of people who have developed their own special sauce, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and they'll kind of fight it for a while, um, yeah. you know, maybe do the standard halfway kind of thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know. But I'm, I'm I'm glad that that it's sort of getting better now that this is. Mm. Um, becoming a more understood way of doing things. And I was talking like I was, on the last show, I was talking to John Blackford about this, about how the, just the, the concept of using an open source community for this kind of a thing is, 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 is new. And so like, uh, it, it obviously took some, some adjustment to get here, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the open source community, it, it's, it's good that this is being led by, big operators who are actually contributing work to it because yeah. very often in, in the rest of the open source community, sort of the wild west that's out mm. there of rando libraries that you <laughs> might pick up, right. is like the, the promise of open source is that, you know, people expected these things to be used and then people, Oh, they contribute back to it. And, you know, and it's all going to grow and but that doesn't happen. No. Right. People but just I, want to it, take it and it, use it. Yeah. Right. I think that it, they've done that. that that's one thing they've got really right i think there is this big culture of contributing back to the community like um i can't say so much on the development side but definitely on the testing side you know we're constantly having interactions with people from a different operators where i just don't think that that well I, I know it didn't happen before um in terms of how we how we test like what frameworks we're using um, people that have developed different ways of testing and contributing that back because the end goal is that everyone helps each other, you know, um, and it, it might really be cool. that, that one missing piece of the puzzle that someone is, is you know, trying to build something and is missing and then suddenly that piece of the puzzle is slotted in, then they can go so much further and then the, the rewards, I guess, come back the other way. So, um, yeah, I think that the, the RDK team have definitely got right, I think um that culture that's there. that's really cool and 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 just so we at qa cafe we end up ex experiencing that directly right mm. because people are obviously other than using our products like it's every industry <laughs> one of the things we've run into is every, every industry is sort of coming in the same situation where we have a bunch of people who have been in the industry for a long time who are leaving and then a bunch of people who are coming on board who are new and there's not a lot of people in between right yeah. present company except accepted right? <laughs> and so it's really hard like like testing is hard it's hard mm. right mm. and so being able to have sort of a community of standard operating procedures and like uh, sort of onboarding on how it is that you even do these things in the first place is is really yeah. great <laughs> exactly exactly because we'll have people that come and they just sit down and they see all this stuff right and they're just told to like run this thing and push this button and 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 mm -hmm. there's no way they could possibly know what that all means and what yeah. the best way to do it is especially when mm -hmm. it comes to continuous integration right like some people mm -hmm. have never done that before mm -hmm. you know <laughs> i think i think with um it's... with testing specifically i think the almost like the unit testing part where you're testing like very very um uh defined areas it you know we're most people are in quite a good place um in, in that part but it's when then you get to the more like compound testing and looking at how it's integrated within your back end and within an app and you know whatever else that's where we really need all of the heads to come together because everyone's having the same challenges everyone has a back end that you know they are probably fighting against everyone has an app that they um are trying to get everything integrated with as well and um, <laughs> you know it, it makes sense for everyone to come together and work out okay what are actually the the best ways to do this um from a from a tooling perspective and from a practical perspective as well um because you know if, if you look at 10 15 years ago customers are doing so much more with their with their home networks right um than they ever were before yeah. and it's 
it's trying to then how do you simulate every single possibility that could be happening in, a, in, a couple <laughs> of <things? laughs> in the lab um so yeah it's, right uh, there's a there's yeah. a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> and the things you can't possibly expect, like uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was the st the story uh, that I that I heard actually was one of the stories that was that made me want to start this podcast uh, mm -hmm. was was with Paul Keeter and he uh, was talking about how they got a field call and it turns out that the 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 restaurant that was that was having Wi Fi problems was so busy that they decided to take the doors off the microwave ovens because it was just too much time to like switch oh, wow. stuff out they had to use <laughs> isn't that a bit dangerous <laughs> how could you possibly expect this oh yeah exactly the one the one that sticks in my mind actually i used to, um like a couple of roles back i used to work actually solely looking at interoperability um with different kind of client devices and the one that sticks in my in my brain the most is when we got a, a field call from a managing director where his his garage door wouldn't connect to the wi-fi and i just thought how am i supposed to be testing all of the different garage doors that are on the market <laughs> you know to check that they're um connecting so it, it, it it's, and it's what does connect even mean well exactly exactly I think it, for me, it's like looking at, okay, how can we cover 85, 90% of the population and the rest of the 10%, you know, that has to come somehow from field trials and, you know, friendly users and all these kind of things where you have these really yeah. niche scenarios. Um, you can't possibly expect right. to cover everything within test. Um, and I think most people are getting around to that idea now. Um, which is good for me because it means that well you know in as much as we all hate it everyone within test hates the time when you get this escape defect it's like the worst thing in the world to have that land in your inbox and someone saying sophie had to oh, yeah. miss the test um but you know people are coming that's, around to that's the i woke i wake up at 3 a.m and yeah. thinking about the problem kind of a it situation is. <laughs> it is it's like oh no <laughs> <laughs> because you feel responsible you know it's um it's not mm -hmm. it's not a nice feeling um and so you know we try our best to make sure things are, are covered as best we can but you have to try and sometimes make peace with yourself that you you can't possibly cover everything 90 percent is a good place well, to so, be. so let's 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 talk about that that's this is good because mm. now i can rip that pin, i can rip the pin out because we <laughs> uh the the we, you talk about how you know consumers are using wi-fi for way more things than they were mm -hmm. right and that makes your job as a as as, as a tester very difficult mm -hmm. um but then you also talk about that 80 percent versus the 20 percent. and one of the things that um you know we've sort of always brought up is that like the the especially in smart home which is totally mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the 99 percent of the users out there mm -hmm. um are expecting things to just work yeah, they should never, ever, ever have to log into their Wi-Fi router. Exactly, it's like when you mm -hmm. turn the tap on, you expect right. it. <laughs> that's what they expect. They literally expect it to be exactly. like your water. <laughs> so how how are you guys sort of experiencing that difference now that people are using using the network for more things? And when yeah. we say using it for more things, what sort of what sort of things are you experiencing where it's kind of getting? To the mm. point where you can't contain it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there is quite a big distinction between the typical user and super users. And I think what actually is happening is that maybe 10, 15 years ago, the percentage of super users was smaller and that percentage of super users is, is growing. So the rest of the population are kind of, although, um, you know, people are using it for more things, it's, it's kind of growing at like a very steady rate, I think. Um, in terms of the fact that, okay, yeah, they're using their phone, they're using their tablet, they're using their TV to connect, but they're not doing anything really challenging, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the percentage of people that are doing those challenging things, like the gaming scenarios, the smart homes, the whatever else, that is growing. Um, and that's the challenge, I think, that we can't necessarily get away with, okay, yeah, the this 1% of people, you know, they're, they're super users and they, to be honest, probably have the technical know-how to 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 be able to log in and, and to some extent maybe fix the problem themselves um but i think as the interest in this whole um 
IoT sphere, I suppose, um, is growing with people that maybe are interested but don't necessarily have so much technical know-how that that's where the challenge lies because they expect it to work but don't necessarily know how right, to fix right, it. Right, 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 right. Or me, where it's like, I, I, right now, you know, the smart home is basically a big DIY thing, right? Yeah. That's why you see the majority of it at like Home Depot. And it's like, yeah. yes, I have the technical know-how to do these things, but I'm also very lazy. And so yeah. <laughs> I don't want to set this stuff up myself. I don't no. want to diagnose it and triage it. No, no. Yes, no. Exactly. And I think, I think it is, you know, on the complete other end of the spectrum, you know, if I, oh, God, I don't know if my grandma will listen to this, but if I use my grandma as an example, you know, She's got no idea, but she does have, she has a tablet. She has a tablet that she uses, but if the slightest strange message comes up that says re-enter your password, it's like completely the world's ended. Um, so I think there is like, there's, if I think now, even more than ever, there's like a really big difference between the people that are really kind of pushing it technology away uh, oh actually maybe i shouldn't say pushing technology away because i think she is trying but just doesn't if you're not familiar with it if like if i was to go and try and do something that i completely wasn't familiar with like i don't know knitting <laughs> i've got no i've got not got the faintest clue um compared to that super users there's there's a really big gap there and it's how do we try and please everyone i think no, it's true. But in, in, it really just comes down to, like you said, like just the, them just wanting it to work because yeah. the, the moment you have that bad experience the, yeah. is the moment you're like, oh, well, I guess this whole technology is not for me. Mm. Right. Mm. You know, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get all these things. Right? They're, they're pushing it away, but it's like it's 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 not worth the time to deal with. It's not worth the hassle to deal with. Um, whereas, you know, mo you know, a lot of people now would okay, maybe have a little bit of background to be able to, even, even if it's just turning on and off again, they at least know the first step maybe to try and um, <laughs> work around it. Um, we don't have to put that in the customer service script anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's so is that is, it's, it's out of, out of the challenges that are causing the most issues that you're allowed to talk about, by the way, feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, <laughs> uh, out of, out of the things that consumers are doing that are the most challenging, what, what, you know, like what, what, what is it? Is it just having more devices? Is it like, you know, and obviously this comes down to for Wi-Fi, it comes down to the particular Wi-Fi technologies that are being used too, right? And yeah. Backwards yeah. compatibility and all that, but. Mm, I think. But what, um, what, what is, yeah. Sometimes it's not so much um one of the challenges that i personally find is that it trying to distinguish feature delivery that maybe a uh, an operator wants to deploy and actually what the the realization of that benefit is to the to to that 90% of customers that's the bit that's most challenging in terms of not maybe not in terms of testing but in terms of the the like broadband sphere in general you know do do most people realize or know or or you know when when you're delivering a um a new firmware update to someone's router do, do they notice a material difference i think that's the challenge right. um to make sure right. that the the service is somewhat improved that people notice and right. from from an operator perspective. Well, it's funny. You it's funny you say that because I I got sort of admonished on a on a panel one time uh, because it, there used to be the adage it used to be that the the best network is an invisible one right because yeah, it's just working yeah. all the time mm. but really that's not the case because otherwise it doesn't seem like you're doing anything <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and right the well, consumer needs to know that you're adding value <laughs> yeah exactly i think it, it it's this um obviously you have the the price war as well which you know i'm not so involved in i'm not involved in at all really but um i could pre completely appreciate that that is a huge part of it and you have you have to fight somehow to keep customers Pe people aren't generally just sticking with you because it's easy nowadays you know it's it's expensive um the, these um solutions that we're yeah. giving to people so you have to make sure that they feel like they're getting their money's worth but on the flip side it's like 
okay, yes, you're delivering all these features, but at the end of the day, you know, if I look at my friends or my family, are, are they actually noticing? Uh, are, you know, it has mm. to be something material, um, I think, for, for some of these things. Um, and I think that's, I know it's not specifically about testing, but, um, well, I guess in some ways it is because you, we have to try and quantify that performance improvement um right. and not necessarily just validating that the feature is working as expected but okay what benefit does it bring to the customer what's the business case for doing this um that that's sometimes right. quite right. challenging right yeah and and it, it's are there any are there any and when when you say sort of delivering features Mm. you're talking about sort of just internal optimization stuff and maybe some well, uh, I mean, management. If I take, if I take um, Wi-Fi signal, for instance, aside from yeah. like, okay, I, I know there's no, not really any clients in the market at the moment that's supporting Wi-Fi 7, but in the next couple of years, but okay, yes, it, it's a it's a shout that we, as an operator, you can use to say our device supports the latest Wi-Fi 7, but mm -hmm. from a customer perspective, like the 90%, are they going to notice a difference? I don't know. Um, that one maybe is a is a bit easier because at right. least you do you do have the throughput difference. Um, you know, you you would you will see that there's a marked increase in throughput. But from a user experience point of view, that's where we kind of have to try and come up with ways to say, okay, yes, there's a throughput um, difference, but it also means this, this, and this. Um, it's trying to put it back into a um, a user perspective rather than keeping it as like right. numbers um, that don't necessarily mean much to the, to the average person. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Right. And, and it's funny. It's, we were talking about this before we started about yeah. how, you know, you feel like your job is to sort of translate the human yeah. world back to the <laughs> engineers, but it's, exactly. it's basically vice versa too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I, I assume you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, okay from a well but it goes both ways so like you know you have to justify to um well in my case the the test is okay why maybe the business wants to um deploy this new feature but then going back the other way okay um if keeping it out of like a lo uh, sending a log file to a senior executive that you know they probably won't you know get their full benefit from um, what does this mean in practical terms? It, it does go both ways. Um, <laughs> You're like, hey, look at this PCAP. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> but yeah, it, it's trying to it's trying to put things into a um, ah, not like, dumb it down is the, completely the wrong phrase to use, but putting it into practical use cases, you know, um, mm -hmm, and making it relate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting and you'll appreciate this. Like one of the things that we've run into, you know, on the CD router side, right. Is we're, we're trying to, it, we're trying to sell to somebody who has never done this process before. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to like the basic protocol level testing, yeah. right. Like DHCP delays and failures mm -hmm. and stuff like that. One of the, one of the pushbacks that, that we get is like, oh, well, how do I know <laughs> you're going to love this? How do I know <laughs> that having DHCP fail once in a while is going to matter to my, to the, yeah. my end user experience? Right? <laughs> and if you can tell me that, then I will improve my testing and automation <laughs> process. And it's like, well, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> that's a really, really, <laughs> I would love to be able to tell you. That. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, that, that, that is, um, as uh, one of the struggle, I think that one of the biggest struggles with testing, okay, there, there are lots, but one of them is reporting. Like, how do you report in a way that makes sense? So the, the, the reports that make sense to developers are completely different to the reports that make sense for the people that, that are maybe making this, the go, no go decisions. So you have to be able to please both <laughs> sides um, when when you're doing uh, and, and even when you're building the test case, you have to think about, OK, how are we actually going to demonstrate these results? Um, and it varies right. from unit testing, system acceptance, et cetera. Um, and, and I guess the 
the audience of the testing changes as you move through the cycle. Um, I suppose and that's try that's kind of how we're handling it really. Um, so when you're looking at unit testing, you know your audience is the developer. When you're looking at acceptance testing, you know the audience is the people that are making the go no go decisions. Um, right, right, right. How right. we, we, we try and to... in a way, the the unit testing side is a little easier. You can be like, this is this. Yeah. There's an exception that got thrown here. Go fix yeah. it. You know? it's, it's, it's a lot easier. So like, you know, unit testing, it's a yes no answer. Like, it's not a performance yeah. answer where there are a billion different permutations and so, like you said earlier like there are a thousand things that could affect this one result that we haven't been able to cover because we haven't got 10 years to test one one release right um, <laughs> so <laughs> that, that balance <laughs> right 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 well so we were talking about stability testing and i i know this this so this this podcast will air after we do the the webinar that we're going to do yeah. but uh <laughs> We're, you know, we we've been talking about stability testing at QA Cafe very often, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, I loved Matt, Matt's answer when we we sort of did a video where he was explaining what the good the steps are for doing good stability testing. Um, to, to summarize, stability testing is when you sort of stress out your device um, and uh, get it to the point where um, you know it, something might happen, but you don't know what that thing is going to be, right? You have no idea. Right. And so uh, what Matt was saying is like, oh, well, now that you what do you do when you get a clean set of stability results? You've been testing your device for four days straight. What <laughs> happens if nothing happens? And he's like, just do it longer. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, that never is, stop is that you can you can never do too much stability testing that is the problem like when you can never right. say stability testing is now done <laughs> um so yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a one. To, and, and getting but that stuff tri one of the tricky things is getting requirements oh. for stability testing uh like what does good look like for stability testing that's one of the really challenging yeah well um because it like like you said earlier it differs for different people you know um right you have to try and take like the in this case probably the heavier users because that's where the problems are most likely to occur but obviously then that puts an additional layer of complexity onto the stability testing that you're doing so it's a, it's a balancing mm -hmm, act mm -hmm. well one of the the most telling ones that we ever found um is more related to the, the fact that consumers were using more devices connected to their Wi-Fi because what was happening was um, it was it was the number of associations and 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 deassociations that were causing the device to build up state. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that kind of stability problem is that it's like a silent killer yeah. because it would build up state and then the performance would just suck. Yeah, like it wouldn't stop. Right, it wasn't yeah. causing like like really really big alarms going off it would just be crappy and yeah. like the customer immediately experiences that yeah that's and, it, and it's so hard to figure out what it was yeah i, I think yeah. As, a, as a user like it's more annoying when your when your video is buffering than when it just completely doesn't work because at least if it doesn't work you know where you stand like it's not working it's, it's <laughs> it, you come back to or the, the alternative which <laughs> which people have heard me rant about before but like like from a user experience perspective i would rather amazon buffer the video for me to the point where it will definitely deliver me that movie yeah in high quality without yeah. any interruption exactly. and you know i'll go make popcorn or something just tell yeah. me that it's going to take a while exactly. but rather than have it get pixelated right yeah, yeah. <laughs> i suppose i think this whole um it, a lot of it is about setting expectations isn't it with the customer like what what can they actually it really expect? is like if you've got a mm -hmm. you know i wish i did but if you have like a huge house you're not going to be able to expect that the you're going to get complete whole home coverage from one single wi-fi router and i think there is a bit a part of a part to play with customer education that people right might expect that they just don't know do they i mean why yeah. would you know yeah. um uh, no. If you haven't been involved in... It's definitely things. true. And it's so weird for mm -hmm. us because like we were talking in the beginning that, you know, the rest of the networking world is totally different yeah. because there's a lot of money thrown at it. There's people who are, their entire job is to to plan this for a given campus or a company. Yeah. But for the consumer, like 
we're dealing it with it from the cons consumer electronics point of view, from the retail point of view. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Know? Because people people are going to buy a router and expect it to cover their whole house. And yeah, then they're going to blame the operator when it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm paying however much a month or however much for this um, this extra piece of hardware. I'd expect it to work. And that's fair enough. I, like if I was in their shoes, I would as well. Um, so, you know, it, it is it is tricky because you don't want to put on the box, oh, by the way, this won't work if you've got more than four bedrooms in your house. Like, that's just obviously not from a retail perspective. Conditions apply, see store for details. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's, it's getting the balance between setting customer expectations, but also not shooting yourself in the foot by saying that your product will only work in these specific scenarios. Um, it's difficult. Yeah. And I don't yeah. envy the product team at all <laughs> in, in, in that way. Well, to, to sort of bring things back to, to, to how you got in your position and what mm. it is that you end up doing. Yeah. Do you, so is that, is that something that you have to end up doing is, is sort of translating in that direction? To, yeah right? yeah Where it's, kind of. right so um weirdly so i i did if i go right back to where where i was talking about my uh, year in industry and then i actually went on to the same well i went on to the virgin media graduate scheme um and that was lots of different elements to that but one of them i did do was product so i did get kind of an insight into okay how does the the products world work and what are the things that are important to them um i did then go back to testing but now in my role, um, I, you know, I do have to translate back to the, to that we have, we have a couple of different teams. We do have like a technical product team who are very kind of well-versed in, in, um, you know, if I tell them a, a result in a technical way that they will definitely understand it and in some ways know more than I do. Um, but there is the complete other end of the spectrum where, you know, they, they are looking at it from a more practical perspective. And so you do have to do that translation um so yeah right right i i, I feel that as as yeah. a <laughs> as a person whose title is not made up but it's very specific <laughs> right technical mark technical marketing is yeah. is, is, is yeah. it's hard to do that <laughs> exactly because i'm sure you're you're the same you know at least completely will vary in the in the amounts of technical know-how that they have and um, some will be completely off the mm -hmm. scale intelligent you know are uh, completely in it and then some of them have other priorities um yeah it's, it's tricky right 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 no no it's true and and, and with, with people like you it's like it's very it's rare for us to to find somebody who gets it <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> like with testing right <laughs> <laughs> and the thing so, is i, like, I appreciate to, you <laughs> yeah like it's it's tricky because you know in I, I'm not afraid to say like my team know this I am not the world's most technical genius out there like I'm definitely not in that scale they know way more than I do um about you know uh, how our testing frameworks work how um how the actual you know code is developed everything like that they know way more than I do and I'm not afraid to be that person that doesn't know I think sometimes there can right. be in, in teams like this in development teams there, there can be sometimes um, you can fall into the trap where everyone is in, you know, it has that blinkered view. Um, whereas I do think, and I'm not trying to pick myself up here, but you do need some of those people that that aren't so in it um, and that can look at it from a bigger picture and say, mm -hmm, guys, mm -hmm. like, does this actually make sense from a practical perspective? Um, because you know, I can I can appreciate from their perspective. They're so focused on on what they're doing that it's it's hard to see outside. They have to be. They have to be, and yeah, they should exactly. be, right? It's like it's, job. It's, um, it's the reason why we have different jobs. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it, yeah, you you do need different people within within the team to try and uh, you know, make it rounded. Yeah. Exactly. And and I I like to think that one one of the things that I appreciate about networking as an industry and this came up when we were trying to um we were in the process of hiring some new people uh mm -hmm. on the sales side of things and it can be a little intimidating at first but one of the things that i appreciate about networking is that it's kind of a low like the basics are a low bar to, bar of entry right mm -hmm. like you can you can learn and understand the technology and understand how to talk about the technology mm -hmm. quickly right yeah. 
it's yeah. hard. It's hard to master, like anything else, hard to master. But it's not like, you know, it, it, it's not like it's not quantum physics yeah, or something. You know, <laughs> to pretty much everyone, right? Right. You, you, like I said earlier, you use it. You know, you you can understand. You can relate it back to your yeah. own life, and therefore it's then e the like exactly like you said, the barrier to entry is kind of lower um, than other industries. I think. Right, exactly. And to wrap things up, the reason, <laughs> because we're able to relate to it, because we're in the home networking technologies, that's what makes testing not boring. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that was a great segue there. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when my family asks me what I do, and it's something other than something to do with computers, exactly. that's what I can tell. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Sylvie. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this is yeah, really fun. Um, you know, anytime, anytime we want to do this again, yeah. we're more than willing. Um, the usual, uh, the usual end stuff that I like to say is, you know, if you really enjoy this and you've gotten this far, I know the Google Analytics say that not many of you have gotten this far, but if you've gotten this far, please hit that subscribe button, <laughs> like this, comment on it. All that social media stuff matters um, for because the robots care about those things. <laughs> and uh, if uh, above all, own the nerdy things that you love and have fun doing them. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks. <laughs>